X Talks connects professionals in the life science, medical device, and food industries with useful content like webinars, job openings, articles, and virtual meetings to help you succeed in your career. This food industry focused podcast brings together some of our editorial staff to share insights into the latest B2B industry news to help keep you up to date. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Xtalks Food Podcast. I'm Sydney Perlmutter, Senior Food Industry Journalist and Webinar Moderator at Xtalks.com, and this week I'm joined by Vera Kovacevic. Thank you for coming today. All right, so I'm going to start us off with a very interesting story about some new um, ways that um, are being researched into to extend um, the shelf life of meat. So the food industry is sort of slowly moving away from chemical preservatives like nitrites in meats due to health concerns. And this has prompted researchers both in Spain and in the U.S. to explore yeast and nitric oxide, or NO, um, respectively, as neutral preservatives to extend meat shelf life. So in terms of um, the current methods like nitrites, um, in 2015, the WHO or the World Health Organization classified processed meat as carcinogenic due to nitrites forming cancer-causing chemicals during curing. And now the EU recently tightened regulations on nitrites and nitrates in foods, including meats, fish, and cheese. And then studies also link nitrate additives to an increased risk of type 2 diabetes, prompting the search for safer safer curing methods. So I'll start off with the study in Spain. So scientists there found a safer nitrate alternative in yeast found naturally in pork loin. So this yeast um, could help reduce the use of nitrites and salt while preserving meat quality. Um, So just a little bit more about this study. This began over a decade ago. Um, Professor Jose Ramos and his team at the University of Cordoba began uh, began researching yeast in pork loin, and they isolated yeasts that developed during the meat's maturation. Their findings revealed these microorganisms influenced the final product's characteristics. So the team tested the yeast preservative's capability preservative capabilities by conducting a volatile compound inhibition assay. And these results showed mold inhibition rates exceeding 75% in all conditions. And this finding supports the yeast potential as a preservative in cured meats. So to verify the yeast's effectiveness, researchers researchers inoculated Iberian pork loins um, from this um, meat producer in southern Spain um, that I won't try to pronounce. Uh, They followed International Organization for for Standardization, or ISO standards, for food quality and microbiology, but the taste did not fully meet the market expectations. So specialized panelists and regular consumers noted a loss of sensory quality despite acknowledging the product was overall good. Taste obviously remains a critical factor for meat products, so researchers observed that while they preserved the pork loin's characteristics and extended its shelf life, improving taste is essential. So the team is now working with another yeast strains um, to enhance the flavor while maintaining food safety and extending meat shelf life. So yeah, I think they made a good point in this. Like, It's great that it extended the shelf life, but if there's a loss in, in taste that is noticeable, it may not be worth it. I wonder um, if there is anything they can do mm. like while keeping the same preservative method because it clearly impacts the taste. Like, How are you going to get the taste back? Maybe you use less of it, you get less of either, the yeast? Yeah, maybe either less of it or they're obviously trying with a different strain of yeast mm. now because I can imagine you know, yeast impacting the taste. The taste because yeah. yeast itself is like a pretty powerful taste. You know, taste. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I think it's really important. Like, wh- I think why they're doing this in the first place is because obviously we know that meat is very prone to spoilage, especially during periods of like transportation and, mm-hmm. um, you know, when the refrigeration may not be as consistent. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think this is awesome. And the study in the U.S. is, is using slightly different methods, so I'll, I'll get into that now. So this, this study going on is at Texas A&M University, and their researchers are developing a method to cure meats without nitrates, obviously. And this one is funded by the USDA's Agriculture and Food Research Initiative, or the AFRA. So many processors currently use vegetable powder from celery, actually, which is a natural nitrate source, to cure meats. However, as you can imagine, these products often have a detectable vegetable taste, making them less flavor f- favorable than traditional cured meats. 
So Dr. Wes Osborne, he's the Associate Professor of Meat Science at Texas A&M. He's exploring a method to generate NO um, and residual nitrite without adding natural or synthetic nitrites. So his method involves adding L-arginine to meats, which activates the nitric oxide synthase, or NOS, enzyme, converting the L-arginine to NO and l culture. Uh, citrulline. So NO gives cured meats their pink color and forms nitrite, acting as an antioxidant and antimicrobial to enhance meat shelf life. So the, feasibil the feasibility of the process must be validated across various meat products under different conditions. And Dr. Osborne is developing a prototype amino acid cured ham to undergo manufacturing analysis for color, sensory factors, texture, and shelf life. And variables like arginine concentration, meat pH, temperature, and time will be adjusted to optimize NO generation. So this research is currently in its second phase and will move to pilot plant production. And this innovative approach could revolutionize meat curing, ensuring safer and long-lasting meat products. So a bit of a different method that they're going for. Um, mm -hmm. With all of that, I mean, what, what, is your, what are your thoughts on both of these methods? Yeah, well, I personally think like the first one has a more unique approach because they're using a totally um, new method of like avoiding the nitrite residual or production at all. So they're using the yeast method, right? which I think has more um, promising potential perhaps, although it does sound like it would be very expensive to implement um, because, you know, it's not a synthetic chemical. It's like you're actually using yeast. Mm -hmm. So it may be a little bit more expensive, but um, definitely has sounds promising to me, um, the study from Spain. Mm -hmm. um, but Sydney, while you were talking, I was really mostly thinking about like what, are the processed meats that use these um, chemical, like synthetic compounds? It's the nitrites you were talking yes. about. Like yes. I mostly imagine cold cuts, but maybe there's more. Well, you're not wrong. I mean, the deli meats like the chicken, turkey, roast beef, salami, like sausages um, have um, nitrites in them. But then also uh, bacon, sausage, hot dogs, and ham, and obviously pork as well. Okay. So it is a, it can be a lot of meats. Oh yeah. That yeah. does sound like a lot, right? Mm -hmm. What about the frozen food? Like, you know, like the breaded chicken and stuff. Ooh, that's a good question. I, chicken doesn't seem to be part of this whole nitrite, um, what about family? the breaded fish? That's a good question. I eat that a lot, so I want to know. fish, you want to yeah. make sure they don't have nitrates? <laughs> yeah. And do you know, actually, while I'm looking this up, um, are nitrates considered like an ingredient in foods? You know what? I think if they're added, they should be part of the ingredients list, but I'm not 100% sure. I know that preservatives do appear on the ingredient lists, right? Mm-hmm. They do. And artificial flavors, mm -hmm. any flavors appear, um, like colorings appear, right? Mm -hmm. So in my opinion, they should be part of the ingredients list because they were added to the food. You would think. Yeah. Hmm. I'm getting some mixed results about fish. Um, more okay. about how nitrates aren't specifically toxic to fish. Okay. That's okay. not what we're talking about. Yeah. Nitrates are concerning me. Any nitrate is technically toxic to something, especially sensitive to fish. I wouldn't worry too much about, okay. it seems, yeah. I, it's, I, it's probably more in the other types of foods that you Yes, mentioned. yes, okay. definitely the meat. So I think one of the limitations, actually, of the first study was that they were just, it's just focused on pork. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure if this yeast method would translate into other oh, types of meat. That's a great, yeah. And then for the second study, the limitation, well, they've, they're they trying it on ham. So same question. I'm not sure if it would also translate into, into other types of meat. Because I imagine every meat that does go through, uh, you know, processing and curing, it's slightly different. Yeah. I don't think it, it's all the same. So, yeah. And I think, like, what's unfortunate about these, like, um, preserved meats, I think they contribute mostly to colon cancer. Oh, is that right? I think so. Yeah. Oh, wow. So it's, uh, I'm actually, I was actually surprised that you said that the WHO classified it, what did they classify? It was all a carcinogenic. All processed meat? Classified processed meat as a carcinogenic. Wow. Yeah. And that was in 2015. So that was a while ago. Yeah. And now just to get into the like 
meat of it. Um, in their Q&A there, when asked what do you consider as, as um, uh, processed meat, um, it says processed meat refers to meat that has been transformed through salting, curing, fermentation, smoking, or other processes to enhance flavor. Um, so most processed meats contain pork or beef, but processed meats may also contain other red meats like poultry um, or meat byproducts such as blood. Um, and then they give the examples of processed meat to include hot dogs, ham, sausages, corned beef, and beef jerky, as well as canned meat, you and meat-based preparations and sauces. So that's what they consider to be uh, processed meat. And so they consider all processed meat to be carcinogenic, which, yeah, kind of surprising. Obviously, you know, if you're eating it every day for every meal. Which a lot of people do, actually. Yeah. Because I think yeah. they, I think, I think people just may not know. You it's know, just they, convenience. It, it's so convenient. And they also, like, I feel like a lot of people would assume that it's natural. I mean, how... If you're looking at meat, how unnatural yeah. do people think it is? I mean, I know that deli meat and, you know, these meats and hot dogs is – like, we're told, I feel, yeah. that, you know, they're, they're quite processed and we don't quite know what's in them, but they are very convenient. Yeah, and they taste amazing, so. Yeah, it's all those nitrates. <laughs> yeah, I, I do think a lot of people actually may eat it more than five times a week, so that's mm. a problem. Yeah. That, yeah, that's another question, actually, is um, – yeah, how many cancer cases every year can be attributed to the consumption of processed and red meat? And it says about 34,000 cancer deaths per year worldwide. Oh, okay. Wow. Mm. Yeah, everything in moderation. Exactly, everything in moderation. And that leads us very well into our next story, actually. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the daily value um, thing that we see on our nutrition facts label. So this has been a staple on nearly every packaged food um, product in the U.S. since 1994. Um, so it's... it's 30th anniversary, I suppose. Um, so this was introduced to enhance consumer transparency, um, and it has evolved into a model for various industries, prompting socially responsible markets through intuitive information dissemination. So the history um, and implementation of the Nutrition Facts label are more complex, though, than they appear. So the Nutrition Facts label was mandated by the Nutrition Labeling and Education Act of 1990, and this legislation was introduced to address the increasing prevalence of chronic illnesses associated with unhealthy diets. So in 1993, the FDA rolled out the Nutrition Facts panel as a tool to empower consumers to make healthier dietary choices, and the primary goal was to provide clear nutritional information, but the label also embodies numerous political and technical compromises. So specifically for daily value, um, it is the percent daily value or percent DV that we see. And it's typically the first thing that we see um, on the nutrition facts. So the daily value percentage on the label originates from various sources reflecting diverse public health targets. Um, and it's the recommended values for micronutrients such as vitamins are derived from the Recommended Dietary Allowances, or RDA, that's set by the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. So these values focus on preventing undernourishment by meeting minimum nutritional needs. Um, and conversely, daily values for macronutrients like carbs, fats, and proteins are based on the USDA's dietary guidelines. So these values emphasize the negative nutrition, so to speak, encouraging maximum intake levels to prevent overeating and um, related health issues. So the daily values for micronutrients micronutri represent minimum intake goals, while those for macronutrients signify maximum limits to avoid health problems. Um, so in terms of, you know, the, the timing of when this was introduced, to me, it only being 30 years old kind of surprised me. Like, I had, did you ever think about, like, you know, what was on, was there an equivalent beforehand? Yeah, actually, no, I never yeah. thought about that. Did I you think, did you think, what did you think about the just age of it? wasn't there. Yeah. I thought, I was actually, wait, you were surprised that it was. That it's so young. Oh, really? Yeah, you were surprised it's so old? Yeah, yeah. Ah. <laughs> yeah, because I thought maybe, maybe they would implement this in the 2000s or something, like once mm. we have more better like science to like measure all mm -hmm. these things and 
calories and all of that stuff and daily value of different micro and macronutrients. It sounds like something that would have been started in the 2000s, not in the 90s. I think I just assume since it's been in my life for my entire lifespan that it's been around forever. (laughs) I don't know. I I definitely agree that, you know, it it does seem like in this scheme of, um, you know, the food industry, it does seem like a, a relatively new thing and it is. But I just can't imagine a, a packaged food without it. Without it? Oh, yeah. Okay. Because, I mean, it's, I mean, they, they introduced it to, you know, for consumers to be a little bit more empowered about their, their choices. And mm-hmm. I would be probably eating a lot less healthy if I didn't know, you know, if oh, I didn't know it was yeah. in these foods, right? Yeah. Like, that's true. Or I would be completely underestimating the amount of calories in something. Like, yeah. Yeah. So. It is, it is like very, very, very helpful to consumers, mm-hmm. um, especially those who need to like watch, like who have specific health mm-hmm. issues, right? Like they need to watch their sodium intake mm-hmm. or their potassium intake mm-hmm. if they have like at 